Hey, what's happening, guys? Uh, welcome back to the channel. It's me, Rocco, again, and thank you for joining me for another classic album review. Today, we're going to be taking a look at Progressive Rock Giants, King Crimson, once more. And uh, this time, we're going to be taking a step back to 1970, talking about their third studio album, Lizard. And uh, a very, very controversial album. It seems that this album here, among all the early King Crimson albums, really divides the fan base. Well, maybe this one and the following album, Islands, but I, I find that this album here, it's one of those either you love it or hate it kind of albums. Uh, and, you know, often when I talk about albums like this, like, you know, for example, Black Sabbath's Never Say Die, Yes is Tales from Topographic Oceans. I often find that, you know, both sides really have strong points, okay? Like both the detractors and the people that praise the album. Now, for me, I usually lean more towards the positive end, usually. Uh, so likewise, on this album, I'm going to be kind of focusing on the good parts of the album. But I, I do recognize that there are a lot of flaws on this album. It's not a perfect album, in my opinion. But uh, when it's strong, boy, let me tell you, it's absolutely strong. And uh, it, it's just an album that came at a really, really strange time in King Crimson's career. The band was kind of in this state of flux, and their musical direction was definitely not set in stone. So they really didn't know what the fuck they were doing. They were a band that didn't have a plan, and usually that spells disaster. But given the genius of Robert Fripp, I really think, and you know, his choices with the selection of the musicians on this album, and uh, kind of the cohesive the cohesive feel it has, it has like some elements that really run through every track on the album. I think that that was enough to really give this album this distinct flavor in King Crimson's history to really make it an interesting album and an album that I actually come back to quite often. You know, although the, I might not love this album as much as some of their other albums, I, I find myself coming back to this album a lot. Now, there are two songs in the middle of this album I'm going to talk about in detail later that I just don't like, okay? I, okay, one of them has some redeeming factors, but the other one I just don't like. So usually when I listen to this album, I kind of cut those songs out, just make a playlist of my three favorite tracks, and just enjoy a nice, uh, you know, 35-minute album or uh, along somewhere along those lines, which is a good length for me. But again, uh, yeah, just a weird, controversial album that came at a weird time. So definitely probably the strangest King Crimson album, both in terms of their musical direction and in terms of the actual... The actual music on this album is very weird, might be really hard to get into at first, but I think that this album here has a lot of, uh, a lot of hidden treasures. And, you know, I, I know some friends, uh, one friend in particular who considers this one of the greatest King Crimson albums. And, uh, it's funny because Robert Fripp himself, um, if, if you guys are new to King Crimson, Robert Fripp, he's the lead guitar player of the band, the only consistent member throughout their entire lineup. And, uh, kind of like the creative force behind King Crimson. He, he even can't really make up his mind on this album. At first, he hated it, said like it's virtually unlistenable, which is not a good sign when the creator of the album is saying that. Of course, that was a retro retrospective comment that he made. But after Stephen Wilson uh, remixed the album, he started really taking a liking to it. And uh, I got to be honest, guys, I think he really grew to appreciate the album because on recent King Crimson tours, they're reviving a lot of these old tracks like Circus and the title track Lizard and playing them live. So that really does say something. So I, I think that Robert Fripp himself is really turning, uh, really changing his opinion on this album, which is very interesting and shows that, you know, music is really just so subjective. I mean, if you hate this album, I, I can't fault you for that, but I really enjoy it. And of course, I'm going to be talking about the flaws but I really think that the pros really outweigh the cons on this one. And there's some absolutely sublime musical moments. So maybe you'll end up being like Robert Fripp. Maybe this review will make you go back and revisit it. Change your opinion. And uh, that's really the whole point of these reviews. Just to get people to maybe reassess albums. And obviously get into them for the first time. But yeah, that's uh, that's what I'm going to be doing. And you know, it, it goes without saying that when King Crimson played these songs live, it's absolutely wonderful. I mean, I saw them back in 2019. And uh, to this day, still one of probably the greatest concert I've ever seen. They played the title track. Um, they play, No, they didn't play the title track. They played Circus, which was absolutely one of the, the highlights of the entire show. And, uh, you know, these songs were really never played live up until recent years, recent tours. So that was just, you know, it's, it's just uh, really awesome to be living in this day and age when King Crimson has their whole back catalog to draw from. And if you see them live, I know right now with the whole coronavirus thing, it's not going to happen in 2020, but maybe in 2021, if they're still kicking, 
I definitely recommend you check these guys out because they do fantastic renditions of some of the tracks from this album. And if you don't believe me, go back and check out some of the recent live albums and you can't deny the excellence. So, all right, guys, so without further ado, let's talk about the history behind this album. All right, guys, so to understand what was going on with King Crimson at around the time of Lizard, I think it's worthwhile to take a few steps back and talk about what happened just before uh, their second album, In the Wake of Poseidon, because really this was what started this weird transitional state of flux that King Crimson found themselves in when recording Lizard. And uh, it's really interesting because, you know, in 1969, King Crimson were on absolute fire. I mean, here was this band that just came out of nowhere, took the world by storm, pretty much inventing a new genre of music, progressive rock, one of my all-time favorite genres. And, you know, everyone seemed to be into it. It was adventurous music at an adventurous time in music history. I mean, for God's sakes, Jimi Hendrix himself said that King Crimson were the best band around at the time. And, uh, you know, that's coming from Jimi, he Jimi fucking Hendrix. So that goes without saying that King Crimson were at the top of the world at that point. They had released their album in the court of the Crimson King. It made huge waves in the music industry. And uh, it was actually pretty well received at the time. Again, a very inventive album to say the least. And just one of the best albums ever made. I I'm sure that goes without saying. So really, everything was set out for this band to conquer the world, to be the next biggest thing. But sadly, one of the greatest shames in music history it all came crashing to an end because right when they started going on tour, some of the members of the band, specifically uh, Michael Giles, the drummer, and uh, Ian McDonald, the saxophone and keyboard player, again, very important members of the band, did a lot of the writing at the time. They just couldn't really keep up with uh, you know, the pressures of touring and they couldn't handle the fame and the success they were receiving. And they found that uh, Peter, Fr uh, sorry. Uh, Robert Fripp wanted to lead the band into a darker, more sinister direction, which would eventually come into fruition on their album Lark's Tongues and Aspect. But they weren't really into that. They were into more of the pastoral, romanticized kind of stuff, um, which was evident on their debut album. And I think that's that's a reason why a lot of people uh, find that album really accessible, really easy to get into, is because of that less experimental, more romantic, pastoral edge. Of course, you do get a lot of experimentation. I mean, come on, look at Schizoid Man and Moonchild. But that's besides the point. There's just a lot of accessible melodies to really latch onto with that debut album. And Robert Fripp wanted to go into more avant-garde, more experimental, atonal kind of territory. And the band just wasn't into that. So by the end of the tour, uh, Michael Giles and Ian McDonald, uh, they wanted to leave the band. And, and, you know, Fripp loved King Crimson this much that he was actually willing to leave the band because he knew that Michael Giles and Ian uh, McDonald did so much of the writing on the debut and, and he considered them to be more important than the band himself, which is extremely ironic because he's been carrying the King Crimson ship all these fucking years and he really is King Crimson. He, he is the Crimson King. And yeah, so Fripp was actually acting pretty selflessly here, really recognizing the strength of their contributions and, uh, you know, having the insight to know that he might not be able to carry this band on his shoulders. Now, he wasn't completely alone. He had his trusty sidekick, Peter Sinfield, who was basically the band's lyricist and um, basically had a lot of input on their artistic direction with their album cover artwork and also their lighting shows when they played live. Uh, did the occasional synthesizer here and there. So really a unique role in a band, not really playing any instruments or performing live. But uh, he was on board with all the ideas Fripp had and he was totally in with the you know, the darker direction and the more jazzy, uh, avant-garde route that Robert Fripp wanted to take. And uh, then we had, finally, last but not least, Greg Lake, uh, one of the all-time greatest progressive rock singers. Obviously, he'd go on to be an ELP, which, uh, you know, I'm, I have some really controversial opinions on that band, so I'm not going to say them here. But at this point, when they were on tour, he was kind of tempted by Keith Emerson, who was in the band The Nice, who would open up for King Crimson on their U.S. tour. And uh, he really enticed Greg Lake to uh, to join him to form a supergroup, which would eventually become ELP. And of course, at this point, Greg Lake really took the opportunity because he saw that King Crimson was falling apart with uh, Ian McDonald and Michael Giles jumping ship. And it was the perfect opportunity for him to do so as well. So that's what he did. He seized the day and joined ELP. But anyway, that's besides the point. So Robert Fripp didn't think he could manage it. But at the end of the day, they all decided they... Ian, Ian McDonald and uh, Michael Giles agreed that Fripp really was King Crimson, although he didn't write 
the majority of the songs. His creative input and his artistic direction is what was really driving the band. And to make a long story short, they ended up leaving. So here we had Robert Fripp and Peter Sinfield, as well as Greg Lake. But at that point, Greg Lake wasn't really invested, and he would go on to do things with ELP. So the band was kind of scattered and all over the place. Again, the biggest shame. Who knows what would have happened if this band continued throughout the 70s. And, you know, I'm not discounting the stuff they would do later on in the 70s because it's actually fucking fantastic. But, I don't know, I just, I, I just love to go to some, like, alternate universe and see what would happen if that band made, like, 10 albums or something crazy like that. It would be absolutely phenomenal. But anyway, so King Crimson found themselves at this weird point, and uh, they released this album in the wake of Poseidon, which was kind of like uh, a follow-up to In the Court of the Crimson King. I'm going to review it one day, but a lot of people say it's like a copy of that album. I kind of disagree. Like, it has similar elements, sure, but I wouldn't say it's like a carbon copy of In the Court of the Crimson King. Uh, it, it, it did, you, you did see a lot of that more sinister vibe going on with that album, with uh, the Devil's Triangle and things like that. But it wasn't really a band album. It was more of just Robert Fripp's compositions. And he brought Greg Lake back into the band. Which is kind of funny because he had left at that point. But uh, he offered to trade him the whole PA system of King Crimson in return for his vocal uh, contribution. So Greg Lake is actually singing on that album. And he also got his friend Gordon Haskell to sing Cadence and Cascade. Who was an old friend from high school or something that he who agreed to uh, appear on the album. They also got um, Michael Giles and his brother on bass to come back into the band and kind of lay down some tracks, more like session, session musicians, as well as the session musician Keith Tippett, who's basically this jazz-inspired uh, keyboard player. So really think about this album as uh, Peter Fripp, why do I keep saying Peter Fripp, Robert Fripp and uh, Peter Sinfield kind of solo album with uh, some session contributions from some of the members from In the Court of the Crimson King. So it really wasn't a full band collaboration, and it really shows because they didn't go out on tour to promote it or anything like that. It kind of just was released and, you know, was nowhere near as great as in the Court of the Crimson King, although it does have a lot of highlights. But we'll get to that on a different date. So here the band were, they had this album, and, uh, you know, Robert Fripp wanted to go on tour, but he had no band to go on tour with. So after the sessions for In the Wake of Poseidon, he was basically begging all the musicians on that album to kind of stick with them to go on tour. So, for example, Keith Tippett, uh, he was kind of insisting, like, come on, stay in the band. You know, we'll make a few more albums. And he was really a session guy, so he wasn't into that. But uh, he, he decided to stay on for their next album, which will be this one here, Lizard. And uh, Gordon Haskell as well, who uh, really thought he was just going to be contributing to that one track, Cadence and Cascade. But Fripp ended up persuading him to stick around to make another album. So, uh... On Lizard, we got Gordon Haskell on bass and vocals. And, uh, and yeah, and Peter Sinfield was already in the band. But the most important addition was they got Mel Collins from a band called uh, Circus. And, sorry, I forgot to mention, they actually got Mel Collins back when they made it in, in the wake of Poseidon. He was, he was on the sax and uh, keyboard, not keyboard, sorry, flutes and sax and, you know, all those woodwind instruments. Basically replacing uh, Ian McDonald's contributions. But, again, as a session musician. But... He decided to stay on for Lizard as well. And I absolutely love Mel Collins. I mean, he is absolutely all over this album, Lizard, as well as uh, In the Wake of Poseidon, having some pretty big contributions. It's kind of sad that he only stayed in the band for a few albums. I really liked his saxophone and flute playing, and uh, thought he brought a lot of the, that nice, jazzy personality to the band. Now, thankfully, he's in the band right now, believe it or not. He joined again back in 2013. And uh, he's performing on their current, uh, their current tours, and he gives an absolutely stellar performance. Again, I, I can't recommend seeing this band live enough. And I, I really think that might be another reason why Fripp kind of changed his opinion on this album. Because Mel Collins is back, and he had a significant role on the making of Lizard. And, uh, you know, obviously they're going to be wanting to play those songs live now that he's back in the lineup. So, uh, good job, Mel Collins. And he, he does a great job on this album. So basically, we had this ramshackle band of session musicians, and people didn't really want to tour, but Fripp took it for what it was, and they went to the studio to record uh, Lizard, this album here. And the thing was, I, th here's where I think Robert Fripp really stumbled on this album, and really what caused the band to splinter apart again at, at the end of this album here, was that him and Peter Sinfield really took creative control again. They pretty much wrote all of the songs and led the musical direction with an iron fist. And I guess at this point, uh, with no other opposition in the band, no one was there to really oppose Robert Fripp from taking that lead position. And there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, it can't leave a bitter taste in 
a musician's mouth. And that musician in particular was uh, Gordon Haskell. I mean, he really did not like the way that Fripp was uh, treating the band, kind of like a dictator. And Fripp, you know, he has this notorious reputation for not really uh, being easy to work with. Again, a lot of a lot of people with a strong opinion, a strong creative drive are kind of like that. So you can't really blame him for that, but uh, he really bullied the band. And I should also mention a, a new addition to this band here was um, uh, e, uh, Andy McCulloch, or McCulloch, a drummer that was recruited for uh, playing on Lizard. And he's actually a damn good drummer. I, I like his performance on the album. Funny enough, he would later uh, leave the whole music business and pursue his career in yacht sailing and things like that. But uh, I think he gives a good performance on this album. Pretty, uh, pretty similar to Michael Giles, I would say. Uh, you know, probably not as great, but, you know, he, he holds it down. He does a good job. And uh, apparently Robert Fripp was treating him like shit as well. And Gordon Haskell just, you know, they, he, he, they went way back with Fripp. So he probably knew how Fripp was, again, going back to their high school friendship. And uh, he actually witnessed, I can't believe this, he actually witnessed uh, Andy McCulloch like crying at points from Fripp's, the way Fripp was treating these guys. Uh, but apparently he said that we're, other people would cry. He would just laugh. He didn't really take it seriously. And that's a main problem with this album. Gordon Haskell did not take this shit seriously. Again, he thought he was just going to be singing on that one track on In the Wake of Poseidon. But here he was, Fripp persuading him to sing on this entire album. And he was just not into the music. He did not understand this whole progressive rock thing at all. He was more of like a, a low register kind of singer. More of a fan of blues and soul and, and things like that. And King Crimson were just the total opposite of that. They were just this weird mix of classical jazz and uh, European-style rock. So as far away from the American side of things as you can possibly get. Uh, again, with the jazzy influence on this album, you know, it's debatable. Again, it's debatable. But but still, it wasn't enough soul and enough blues for, um, for Gordon Haskell to really latch onto and enjoy. So he really didn't have a good time recording the album. Again, if you don't believe in something, you know, you're not going to enjoy recording it. And uh, the famous story is when he was singing the track "Indoor Games," uh, that crazy laugh you hear at the end—that wasn't—that wasn't intentional. I mean, that was an improv, an impromptu laugh because, believe it or not, Gordon Haskell couldn't believe how shitty the song was, and he just broke out in laughter at the end at the line where he had to sing the words "Hey ho." He just found that so ridiculous, and uh, the band thought that was great. They just kept it in. They thought it added to the whole artistic flair of the album, but really, it was just Gordon Haskell. Uh, not giving a fuck, and really, at the end of this album, he was gone, I mean, they wanted to go on tour to promote it, and uh, they wanted him to use all these crazy synthesized effects on his vocals, and he had enough of that shit, so he left the band, and it was pretty acrimonious, uh, according to Wikipedia, apparently he sued Fripp later on for che being cheated out of roy royalties and things from the album, so uh, yeah, Gordon Haskell was, that was probably the end of their friendship, but yeah, he later, um, he would later go on to do other things. He had some big hits in the late 70s, I believe. Not that I've really heard in any of them, but uh, but yeah, I do think that his his performance on the album is actually pretty good when he's not when his voice isn't being heavily synthesized. But we'll get into that later. Another thing I should mention about the recording of the album: these guys got a fucking brass section, so you got the horns in there and a lot of those like reed instruments and things like that. Again, giving some of the tracks here this big band jazz kind of feel. So that was a nice addition to the band as well. Plus you got the Mel Collins sax and flute and all that stuff. So a lot of wins on this album as well. Nice. Pretty nice. And of course you got uh, Robert Fripp on the guitar. He took over the Mellotron duties. Some great Mellotron sections here. And uh, really was like, think of this as a King Crimson big band style. Which uh, I find pretty cool as well. Too bad it had to all come splintering to an end. And again, Andy, Andy McCulloch as well like left the band right after Haskell. Keith Tippett, he was always just a session musician, so he wasn't really planning on staying for long. So really, by the end of this, it was just Mel Collins, Fripp, and Peter Sinfield really back to square one again. And uh, then they would recruit Boz Burrell for the Islands album, their fourth album. And again, that's a story for another day. So really, this album was just a unique period in King Crimson's history, where their whole lineup was fucked up. You had half the members of the band not even into the music. You had a fucking horn section coming in. It was just... Cra fucking crazy time and yeah to make matters even stranger they even got john anderson from yes to uh to do some guest vocals on the title track which uh which was actually a great addition but yeah strange strange stuff but one thing that i think a lot of king crimson fans will have to agree on is that this album cover is one of their all-time greatest i mean you gotta love the medieval lettering with 
king on the front, crimson on the back, and the ornate images really describing all the scenes from the tracks on this album. Absolutely fantastic album cover, one of my favorites. And I really think King Crimson had some of the strongest album covers at this point. Uh, obviously, their debut being the greatest. But this one here is a close second, I would say. Great fucking album cover. Uh, I gotta give credit to the artist. I think his name was Jeannie Barnes. Or she, I can't, I don't know if Jeannie is a male or female name. But absolutely fantastic uh, album cover there. And, uh, and yeah, so if you don't like the album, you gotta at least love that fucking album cover. So yeah, just... Really kind of like the black sheep of King Crimson's discography at this point. Uh, so now, without further ado, let's dive into my overall review of this album, because there's just so much shit going on. Alright guys, so where do I even begin with an album this crazy? I mean, this this is just like the band throwing everything in the kitchen sink at you. But, uh, but again, I feel like the album does have some cohesion. Minus those two tracks in the middle I was talking about. I think there's some, some elements that really run through this entire thing. I guess the first thing I'll start off with is... Uh, the album structure itself. I mean, side two of the album is really unique in King Crimson's entire discography, where they attempt a long, side-long suite. One of the first in progressive rock history. I don't know which one came first, uh, this or um, Plague of Lighthouse Keepers by Vandergraaf Generator. Uh, they're both fantastic, epic length songs. But yeah, very, very early in the history of progressive rock. And uh, King Crimson would never do that again. Sure, they would write like some long closing tracks, like... Obviously, we had in the court of the Crimson King opening up, uh, closing out the album on their debut, and then Starless on Red and things like that. But they never had a sidelong thing. And let me tell you guys, that is a fantastic suite. Uh, probably one of the all-time best King Crimson songs. Probably somewhere in my top five. And uh, really, at first, that track really didn't do much for me, uh, minus the first four, four minutes of the track, which is absolutely amazing. But the rest of it, if you're not into jazz and, you know, like brass sections and free improvisations you're not really going to like that section of the track but now over time uh, i've acquired more musical experiences more musical journeys and now that whole song just really speaks to me it's, it's one of my absolute favorites so for that reason i would say this album is worth the price of admission alone but not only that on side one you get a collection of songs the first of them being the song circus and this is one of the earliest king crimson songs i ever heard in my life uh, i remember when I actually discovered King Crimson, I believe this was the first song I actually consciously heard. Sure, I probably heard like Epitaph or Schizoid Man or something on the radio back when my radio station Q107 was actually fucking good and not playing the same top 40 hits over and over again. Sorry, got to control myself here. Can't go on these rants. But, uh, but yeah, so other than that, the first time I heard of King Crimson was actually when me and my family, we got these free tickets to the circus from my boss back in the day when I worked at this restaurant, and uh, when I got back home, I, I just looked up, like, you know, the name of the circus and everything, and this track here, the first track on Lizard, Circus Popped Up by King Crimson, and at this point, I was a huge fan of King, I was a huge fan of Progressive Rock, big Genesis fan, big Yes fan, but never really heard of King Crimson, so I clicked on that track, and needless to say, I didn't like it, you know, I wasn't ready for that, I wasn't ready for the experimentation, the jazziness of it, the cacophony, the the dissonance of that track, and I found it really weird, so I, you know, I never really revisited King Crimson for at least, like, you know, a few more, maybe a year, or two years, but anyway, that, this track here is really special to me, nonetheless, and again, I mentioned this was a huge highlight when I saw King Crimson live, so fantastic song, so right there, with the 23-minute title track, and this track here, you already have about, I'd say about half an hour of quality music, or 29 minutes of fantastic, top-notch King Crimson music, and then top that off with the beautiful track, Lady of the Dancing Water. You got yourself a nice, like, 32, 34 minute album. Now here's the problem. The other two tracks on side one, Indoor Games, which has some redeeming qualities, and Happy Family, are just misfires in my opinion. I mean, there's nothing really redeeming about these songs. And I, I know some people that really like them, like a good friend of mine in particular. I just can't get into them. And honestly, like, if I've been listening to an album for years and I still can't get into a song... That I probably never will, honestly. These tracks here are just, ah, man, I hate the overly synthesized Gordon Haskell vocals on them. And they're kind of like just throwaway, kind of weird, avant-garde, quirky tunes. The lyrics are pretty funny. Uh, one track being about the Beatles breakup, and the other one being about, I don't even fucking know, some indoor games. I don't know, it has some sexual connotations to it, I guess. But, uh, but yeah, I really don't like those quirky songs. I guess it was King Crimson trying to do some kind of weird pop 
things there. Kind of like what they did with the song Cat Food on their first album. Sorry, on their second album. But uh, it just doesn't work on this album. They're, it's not very catchy, not very memorable. And honestly, I, whenever I hear this album, I really do skip those two songs. They're, they're really that bad. Uh, again, Indoor Games has some good things about it. But, uh, but yeah, overall, so in terms of the quality of the album, it's pretty inconsistent. But when you have the majority of the album being absolutely as fantastic as the title track in Circus, overall, this definitely is a great fucking album. Maybe not the greatest King Crimson album, but definitely in the upper echelon, like the top half of their albums, I would say. Or, you know, around there. So, really good album. Now, let's talk a little bit about, like, the specifics of this album. So, I mentioned that there's a few themes really running through all the tracks. And the one thing you're going to notice is this album here has a huge jazz influence. And uh, if you're not into jazz, you, this album might be a little bit off-putting. Because uh, jazz, it isn't really an easy genre to get into. It's uh, very musical, less focused on the vocals, more focused on improvs and uh, solos and things like that. And yeah, this album here has a very free jazz kind of kind of feel, especially with the brass section, or maybe I shouldn't call it a brass section, but you know, like the trombone and all those woodwind instruments going on, and then Mel Collins' flute and sax playing, as well as Keith Tippett's very jazzy piano playing, that uh, really, you know, you could really see it on, on Cat Food on their preceding album, where that came from, just really running throughout the entire album, so a very free jazz kind of thing, but still has a lot of those, like, really sinister King Crimson elements that, uh, you know, appeared on the debut, were progressed a bit forward on, uh, in the wake of Poseidon, and here as well, you could really see that, those darker themes that Robert Fripp were really pushing for, coming back in every once in a while, creating this kind of nightmarish kind of feel, but, you know, it's not like the whole album is nightmarish, but there are certain sections where you get that sinister kind of vibe coming in, uh, especially on the title track, Lizard, and even on Circus, those two tracks as well. So the jazziness, uh, you know, it's a take it or leave it kind of thing. If you like it, then you're really going to like this album. If you don't, then uh, that might be the downfall for you. But for me, I really like jazz, so that gets a thumbs up in my book. And uh, the album here also has a lot of like nice, gentle acoustic moments, which really uh, taken from their debut and the next album, pretty consistent so when people say this is the black sheep you got to admit there's some there's still some pretty beautiful moments with the mellotron swelling up and also uh, some great acoustic guitar playing by robert fripp and some nice gentle sections coming in really beautiful sections there so they don't really sacrifice that but uh a main criticism i have of the album uh it works in some points and doesn't work in others is that you often have this cacophonous almost dissonant musicianship on some points on the album, where you, it seems like all the instruments are playing a completely different song, and they just stitched it all together. And if, again, those two tracks I don't like on the album really make full use of that, and it doesn't really work. But uh, on Circus, it actually does at some points. It creates like this kind of uh, weird kind of feeling, this weird disturbing feeling in the pit of your stomach, and it works to the song's advantage. But elsewhere, it just feels distracting and really being avant-garde for being avant-garde's sake. It really adds nothing to the music. So that's one major, major criticism I have of it. Uh, another major criticism I have of it are the treatment of Gordon Haskell's vocals on some of the tracks. Again, I mentioned on Indoor Games and Happy Family, uh, his voice is really processed through like this fucking synthesizer, and it's just so irritating. And it's a shame because I think Gordon Haskell is actually a pretty good singer, a pretty, you know, lower register, more soulful kind of singer. And on songs like Cadence and Cascade from their previous album, you could really tell that he had this great gentle quality to his voice. And uh, on Lizard, and especially on Circus, they use his voice to create more of a sinister atmosphere, which is really cool. He gives the song like this unsettling effect, this, you know, lower tone lower vocals, which was kind of uncommon in the prog rock world at that point. Usually, like, vocals had a lot of, uh, had a lot of punch. Like, think John Anderson, ironically, John Anderson later appeared on this album. But think singers like that, singers like Peter Gabriel, Greg Lake, they had these big, powerful voices, right? But, uh, Gordon Haskell was just kind of like this run-of-the-mill soul guy, and, like, the lower register he adds to those tracks really gives it this unsettling, kind of out-of-place kind of feel, but I, I like it. But again, I hate when they process his vocals, so that's a big problem with me. So really, those problems are fused together on those two tracks that I don't like. So really, uh, if you take those two tracks out, I really have nothing bad to say about this album whatsoever. Circus, you know, I don't want to come across as sounding weak on this review. I, I mean this with all my heart. Circus and Lizard are absolute masterpieces of the progressive rock genre. I don't want you guys to think that I just like those songs. Like, I love those songs. So really, if you take out those shitty tracks in the middle, 
This album's solid gold. And Lady of the Dancing Water, it's an okay ballad as well. So, uh, you know, not an amazing track, but a pretty good one. So really, this album here, it's just so unique in Crimson's discography. It's hard to pinpoint what it is. It has like this weird avant-garde feel with the jazz musicianship, but it also retains a lot of the beautiful moments. Like, uh, for example, on their debut album, I Talk to the Wind and Epitaph and things like that with the Mellotron swells and like these absolutely beautiful flute sections by Mel Collins. So it still has some of that romanticism. So really a unique album in Crimson's discography that really combined all these different elements and uh, really just threw them at you. And again, Lizard, the title track of the album, uh, it's just this, it really is a musician's kind of track. I mean, there's very little vocals on the tune, except for the opening with John Anderson and then this brief, uh, awesome interlude with Gordon Haskell. It's mostly just this instrumental extravaganza that really goes through everything King Crimson did at that point. It has the sinister dark moments like on the Devil's Triangle. It has the beautiful uplifting moments like on their debut album. And it also has a lot of the free jazz that they kind of pioneered on this one. So really that track there was, was a synthesis of everything King Crimson did up to this point. And really I think a perfect consolidation of uh yeah everything they did up till up till Lizard. Now, one thing I want to mention before I sign off to the track-by-track uh, -track reviews is Robert Fli Fripp's guitar playing. Uh, for an album that was heavily dominated by him and basically just single-handedly written by the guy, his guitar playing really takes a backseat on this album. Sure, he has, a, he has this big epic guitar moment at the end of Lizard, but uh, throughout the rest of the album, he's pretty subdued and he doesn't really do much. His, his acoustic playing, if anything, is more notable than his uh, you know usual atonal classic guitar playing style, electric guitar playing style. So that's pretty cool as well. He really lets the other band members shine, although he did write everything. At least you got to give him credit that, uh, you know, the other band members do get their, do get their fill on the album as well. And, you know, even um, Peter Sinfield, he had some synthesizer moments on the album as well, which aren't that great, to be honest. I think he should have just stuck to the lyrics. Speaking of which, his lyrics on this album... They're pretty good on Circus. They're fantastic. But throughout the rest of the album, they definitely leave more to be desired compared to epics like Schizoid Man and Epitaph and really amazing poetry, if anything. Uh, on this album here, I really think he kind of was kind of lazy with the lyrics, or at least maybe he was going for that more, uh, I don't know, more conventional direction. Again, with songs like Happy Family, Indoor Games, things like that. Uh, Lady of the Dancing Water, more conventional kind of lyrics. So not as thought-provoking as uh, his usual stuff, but not bad. And again, on Circus, fantastic lyrics there. Uh, so yeah, really, I don't know what else to say about this album. Again, I mentioned the drumming's pretty solid, and uh, and yeah, that's that's pretty much all I got to say about Lizard. So a really unique album, definitely give it a shot. And if you like jazz, I really think you're going to dig this album, as well as the next one, Lizards. They carry on a lot of those jazz moments there, but... Uh, here it's it's like really full force jazz. So anyway guys, let's dive into this album track by track. Kicking off the album, we have one of my absolute favorite King Crimson songs. The famous track Circus, spelled with a K instead of a, a C in the middle there. And this track here, just talk about an unsettling, weird track. I mean, this song really has it all. It has moments of absolute beauty. It has moments of absolute dread. And it's just a very, very unique track in King Crimson's discography. They would never really write another song like this. And uh, it's just such a great track opening up the album. And coming in at six and a half minutes, it really gives you something to... It really gives you a lot to love and to latch on to. And uh, probably the second best song on the album. Obviously, the 23-minute title track is going to take the first spot. But this one here is a close second. And this song just really has so much going for it. I mean, ah... Uh, even Gordon Haskell's vocals just perfectly suit this track. Again, I mentioned earlier, his uh, lower register vocals really give you this unsettling vibe and this sense of dread throughout the entire song. But really, everyone's like playing fantastically here. Uh, Robert Fripp does some fantastic acoustic guitar work throughout the entire track. Absolutely crazy. And Mel Collins' sax playing is absolutely... It's awesome, jazzy, and... Uh, really cuts through the mix at some points, really acting as like the lead instrument, as well as uh, Robert Fripp on the Mellotron. There's a lot of great Mellotron sections here. So again, this is one of those tracks that really consolidates everything King Crimson were about in the early 70s. Uh, just some, some highlights of the track. I really love the intro. It starts off with this tinkling piano, very musical box-like, very romantic. 
But then as soon as Gordon Haskell's vocals come in, you start to get that unsettling vibe. And I love how his voice just kind of builds up throughout the verses. And the lyrics here are just absolutely fantastic. Peter Sinfield really went all out and used all this, all these awesome words to evoke fantastic imagery of all the madness going on in this circus. And uh, some pretty unsettling lyrics as well. So really great contribution by Peter Sinfield here. And uh, the song kind of goes... A with that pace, with a tinkling piano for a bit, and then all of a sudden, you get the signature King Crimson menacing riff. I believe it's on the sax, or maybe the trumpet, or something like that, but the, the classic, -na 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 -na. that fucking heavy, heavy-ass riffing that Black Sabbath would have been proud of, that really gives King Crimson that dark, sinister edge. But it's on the sax, rather than the electric guitar, so really unique, and uh, I absolutely love that part. That part there just totally transforms the song, into like a King Crimson masterpiece. But then we get, uh, we, we go back into like the main theme of the track. And at this point, we got uh, the crazy acoustic guitar playing by Robert Fripp. That's all over the place. Just giving the song this, this cacophonous kind of vibe, but really cool. We even get some organ cutting through, I think of the second or third verse. That, that part there is really cool. And uh, arguably my favorite part of the whole song is when the whole thing just winds down. And we get the Mellotrons kicking in. Again, bringing you back to those first two albums. And uh, Mel Collins just cuts through with this beautiful laid-back sax solo. Very jazzy. And a very powerful, uplifting moment of the track. Just cutting through the madness. Uh, it, it's fantastic. The Mellotron strings really swell in this section. And then when Gordon Haskell comes back in, that's actually a pretty powerful moment there. And with, we're both like... I think that the four minute mark at this point, and so far it's been fantastic, but the last two minutes really put that experimental avant-garde kind of edge into the track. Uh, we get like that main sinister riff coming back in, the da -na, but this time it's absolutely cacophonous. And again, at this point here, all the instruments sound like they're playing different things at the same time, especially the acoustic guitar and, you know, the sax and all that stuff and the Mellotron. And it all just comes together. Whereas on a lot of the other tracks on this album, it kind of feels like too much is happening at the same time. That crowded feel at that part really builds the tension and adds to the overall quality of a, a song as strange as Circus, rather than detracting from it. And then at the end, we get this absolutely menacing horn section build up with the... Again, very heavy. So honestly, this, this track here, I just love it. There's nothing like it. It's all over the place. It's got those sinister moments, those beautiful moments with the Mellotron, the unsettling vocals and lyrics. It's just one of a kind. Honestly, I'm tempted to give it a 10 out of 10, but I'm going to stick to a 9.5. It's a fantastic song. Now, track number two, Indoor Games. Uh, again, this is one of those songs that I usually skip when I listen to the album. Uh, and the thing is, overall, it does have potential. There are some moments in the track that I actually really enjoy, but the other half of the song just doesn't really do it for me. And, uh, you know, there's a few reasons for that. First of all, the, the intro of the track, it starts off with this kind of swinging sax and flute kind of melody. And uh, it's kind of a, a playful chamber jazz kind of thing. So not bad, but overall... Nothing I would really go back to. It has some synthesizer from Peter Sinfield that just kind of doesn't really add anything to the track. You could tell he wasn't really a good synthesizer player. And then what really annoys me is when Gordon Haskell's vocals come in. They're just so heavily processed and synthesized and just irritating. Like, frankly, like, I hate the vocals on this track. And it kind of ruins the whole thing for me, even though later on in the song, there's some pretty nice sections. But uh, that intro there, the first two minutes of the song, doesn't really do it for me and I get how the band was going for a more playful quirky vibe on this track but for me it just doesn't work it doesn't I don't really find it funny whatsoever so kind of a failed attempt there but the potential comes in because at the two minute mark the song kind of winds down we get this nice Mellotron section again bringing back the Mellotron very nice uh, contrast to the weirdness of the intro and Gordon Haskell sounds pretty good here he's actually singing without being processed and it just pisses me off because why couldn't the whole song be like that but anyway, I digress. At the 2 minute 40 second mark around there, we get this nice freeform jazz kind of section. We got the, the stop and start guitar playing, trading off with the sax. We got some flute coming in there. It, it's kind of like this nice 2 minute jazzy improv section that I actually quite enjoy. I, I don't mind that section whatsoever. If the whole song was just an instrumental like that, I would give it a thumbs up. But uh, unfortunately, the synthesizer comes in again and it just really doesn't add anything to the track. And, uh, yeah, it's just not enough to really 
to really uh, redeem the track there. But I do like that section. And then it ends with that crazy hey-ho and then the laughter and everything. And the vocals come back in earlier on. It just leaves a bitter taste in my mouth. So for that reason alone, I'm going to have to give the song kind of a low score. I'll give it a 7. It would be higher if it didn't have those annoying vocal sections. But uh, just not a song I want to go back to very often. Now this next track here, Happy Family, unlike indoor games, there isn't really anything redeeming about it. It's just a song that I, I just simply don't like. And uh, it's just, again, it has kind of like the same problems as indoor games, but just magnified. Again, it has uh, Gordon Haskell's vocals heavily synthesized, and it's just a really irritating, almost like fluttering kind of effect on his voice. Sounds absolutely awful, to be honest. And the funny thing is, this track here is actually about the Beatles breaking up. So, go figure. The, you know, with subject matter like that, it could have been such so much better. But, uh, but yeah, basically, the gist of this track is that it's a very dissonant, jet free jazz kind of jam. And, uh, you know, we, we got a little bit of that on indoor games where, you know, we have different instruments playing kind of different things seemingly out of sync. On indoor games, I could tolerate it. I could actually enjoy it. But here, that's just amped up. And it just sounds like... The whole band is just playing totally different things out of sync. And the thing is, I've heard some jazz where bands would do this. Like, it, it sounds like the instruments don't go together, but then the more you listen to it, the more they all fall into place somehow. They lock into this underlying groove. But on this track here, it's just a fucking mess. It's just, you get this jazzy piano, flute, Fripp's guitar playing, just going all over the place in different directions. Just so dissonant, but not in a good way. Sometimes dissonance can actually be good and interesting when used correctly. But on this track here, it, it just isn't. And again, we got that Peter Sinfield synth that comes in every once in a while. And it's kind of weird. The only good thing about this track that I could say is that uh, it opens up with this pretty doomy Robert Fripp guitar riff. Uh, again, it's kind of like underneath the synthesizer, so you got to really listen for it. But it's there, and it's, it's actually pretty cool. But then, soon after that, when it gets into all that free jazz, mishmash bullshit, just not a very good track. Honestly, this one here would probably be like a, a 5.5 .5 to a 6 out of 10. Just, I, I never really feel like listening to this song. So I just got to be honest there. Sorry if you guys like it, but I do not. So now track number four, Lady of the Dancing Water. I, I'm happy this album really picked up the pace with this song because those last two tracks were really testing my patience. But this one here is just a nice, short, three-minute acoustic ballad. It's a really pretty, really beautiful song, especially with Mel Collins' flute playing and um, Robert Fripp's gentle acoustic guitar. And there's even like a little bit of gentle piano there. It's basically Cadence and Cascade Part 2. So if you like that song on In the Wake of Poseidon, you're really going to like this one as well. And Gordon Haskell just sounds absolutely beautiful on the track. Uh, really cool laid back acoustic ballad and uh, really there's nothing else to say about it I think that Cadence and Cascade is the better better track but think of this as like the natural successor to that and kind of a breather after those two insane avant-garde tracks we just listened to so Lady of the Dancing Water I you know I would give it a solid 7.5 to an 8 out of 10 it really gets the job done and really brings the album uh, back into form but uh, that's an understatement because the next track Lizard just propels this album into the stratosphere. So let's dive right into that. All right, guys, so this one here, I want to spend a fair amount of time on this track because, as we all know, it's the main attraction of the album, the 23-minute long epic, Lizard. And this song here, it's a very, very controversial King Crimson song. I've heard a lot of progressive rock fans say that this song here, you know, the first four minutes are great, but then after this song, it really just wanders and goes nowhere and is overlong and unfocused. And I've heard every criticism under the book. And a lot of people say it's one of the worst sidelong epics. Now, let me tell you guys, I couldn't disagree with that more. I consider this song to be a fucking masterpiece. Like, it's one of the greatest songs I ever heard in my life. And you know what? At first, I agree. I wasn't a huge fan of this track. I love the first four minutes with John Anderson of Yes singing. And then after that, I, I, you know, I agree. You, your mind kind of wanders and it gets really weird and really experimental. But, uh, you know, now over the years, it's one of those tracks that with every single listen, it gets better and better and better. And I'm, I'm not just saying that. I'm not just saying that because I want to like the track. I honestly think this song here is just absolute genius and it's amazing how you know coming after side one which was so hit or miss again circus is a fantastic song but those other two tracks were just you know terrible and it, you know coming off of that you really don't know what you're gonna get 
but Lizard is just really one of the greatest King Crimson songs. It has some of their most beautiful moments and some of their most dark, sinister moments that would really get expanded on in later later albums. But uh, it really goes through so many different emotions. And I absolutely love the playing on this track. Again, this is a very jazzy song. But there's a lot of other stuff as well. There's a lot of classical. And there's a lot of just pure progressive rock moments. with the, Especially with the Mellotron and some synthesizer at points. But overall, it's just such a unique song. There's nothing like it. And uh, it's very, you know, music, instrumental focused. If you're, if you're looking for a song that has epic vocals going throughout the song, hooks, melodies, things like that, you're going to be disappointed. This is basically just this huge experimental piece of music that it does have vocals, both from John Anderson and Gordon Haskell, but the majority of it is uh, really this jazzy instrumental jam, I would say. But it definitely has a nice structure to it. And uh, so... It's not just like a free jazz experimental thing like what they were doing on Happy Family and Indoor Games. Like, it, it is pretty structured, and I, I just love every single second of this song. Well, maybe not like the last minute of the track, which is kind of this throwaway outro, but it, it's just really something special. And we really got to dive into this song, really dissect it. It's really a four-part song, uh, and the first part, Prince Rupert's Lament, is what the song is really most known for. It's notable for having John Anderson of Yes on vocals. And it's probably the most accessible part of the song. Probably the most accessible part of this whole goddamn album. And for that reason alone, people seem to really love it. But honestly, I think the rest of the song is even better. Especially the Bolero and Glass Tears section. I think, like, you know, the opening is fantastic, it's beautiful. But the real meat and potatoes, as I always say, like the meat of the track is really the main attraction for me, what keeps me coming back. So yeah, I think that that initial Prince Rupert section is what's going to initially hook you in, but I think what's going to what's gonna keep you coming back for long-lasting appeal is really the rest of the track, uh, which is just absolutely incredible. So okay guys, well, further ado, let's get into this song part by part, and uh, kicking it off with Prince Rupert Awakens. So the song opens up kind of strange with what I consider kind of like a false intro, we have uh, Peter Stinfield coming in with this really sharp synthesizer note that just cuts through. It sounds pretty ominous, pretty creepy, and kind of a, like a foreshadowing, a taste of what's to come later on in the song. But uh, it's a false intro because Prince Rupert Awakens is just this beautiful, classic, classical-inspired ballad, again, sung by John Anderson, who has one of the most angelic voices in progressive rock. And it's just a really awesome song. Uh, again, really accessible. And when I say song, I mean, you know, the first part of this huge lizard suite and again it's just really accessible really beautiful especially with keith tippett's classical inspired piano playing it's just uh honestly it's just really laid back and really awesome the chorus itself is really catchy the part where he sings uh stake a lizard by the throat really joyous really uplifting giving you this kind of sunny vibe and i guess the whole track uh it does describe like this medieval battle and this part here is probably just before everything happens, kind of just setting the scene in this like sunny medieval city that's about to be ravaged by war. And uh, the song really feels like that. There's a few classic King Crimson moments on this section too, so it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Again, you get that sharp synth kind of coming in at points, just creating this kind of jarring juxtaposition with the beauty of the piano and uh, John Anderson's vocals. As well as some great guitar playing by uh, Robert Fripp, some really almost atonal, backwards style playing. Uh, where it sounds like he's playing the guitar backwards. Now, I don't know if he's actually playing a part backwards or if his style is just that innovative that when he plays the guitar, it sounds like it's loop backwards. But nonetheless, it's a really cool effect. So the first three minutes of the track are just pure beauty with little touches of classic King Crimson. But really, the section of this track that, that really takes me by storm is the three-minute mark where the Mellotron comes in and we get this beautiful section. It's just absolutely majestic. This is prog rock at its absolutely most symphonic and we get the whole band kind of singing this ah, it's just so angelic and it just envelops your entire body and again with that mellotron climax you're on cloud nine again one of the highlights of the entire track but uh, it doesn't last long because then we get into the second section of the track bolero and bolero the second part of this song is one of my favorite progressive rock moments. It's completely instrumental, but it contains one of the most beautiful melodies I've ever heard in my life. Again, this part of the song here, it's a perfect amalgamation of both classical and jazz. Starts off with this 
awesome tr trumpet coming in or trombone, sounding very Latin, very Spanish. So a huge contrast with the very European sounding Mellotron and uh, classical inspired intro with Prince Rupert Awakens. And really nice and jazzy. But then before you know it, the flute comes in from Mel Collins. And oh my God, guys, Mel Collins just kills me on this song. And Keith Tippett as well, his piano playing in contrast to the rest of the album, it's very classic, classically inspired. And they dive into this beautiful beautiful melody guys like i can't even tell you every single time i hear this part goosebumps absolute goosebumps it's one of my favorite moments in music history it's just unbelievable how melodic and emotional this this part is it's just ah, it's like the best of the classical composers coming back in the 20th century and just laying down pure beauty pure excellence and uh oh my god just thinking about it just makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up and really throughout this whole bolero section the drumming in the background is just this very like mechanical like ding, 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 kind of like this marching band army kind of beat and the band just like, plays over that and it works so beautifully so great drumming there from andy mccullough just holding it down then before we know we get into the jazzy midsection of the song with the piano and sax coming in and it just totally switches styles from classical to jazz you got to really love it. You got the trumpet going on and you got a reprise of uh, Prince Rupert's theme on the trumpet and uh, it builds and it gets really crazy. Again, you get all these dissonant sections with the instruments playing different things at the same time, but it's all, it all locks into the underlying groove provided by uh, Andy McCulloch on drums and uh, Gordon Haskell on the bass. So again, it seems like it's all over the place at first, but it really has this underlying structure to it which I really like in jazz, when like the bass and drums just hold it down, and the band just does all this crazy stuff on top. Absolutely awesome. And uh, I, I can't really go in depth with this section, you just really gotta listen to it, but it's fantastic. And then it gets into this great horn section, really kind of swanky, uh, loungy kind of feel. Love that part. Then we're about 10 minutes into the track here, and we get that classical flute melody coming back in. And it's almost indescribable how awesome it feels to get a reprise of this melodic section after this that crazy jazz jam. It's just absolutely beautiful. And this time you even got the Mellotron backing it up. So as if it wasn't beautiful enough, you throw in the Mellotron there, and it's just absolutely incredible. So yeah, the whole Bolero section is a, definitely a huge, huge highlight of the entire song. Then we get into the 11-minute really kind of like the meat and potatoes of the track, the Battle of Glass Tears, describing this massive medieval battle with very few lyrics. There's a few lyrics at the beginning here, um, provided by Gordon Haskell, but overall it's just a musical soundscape. So you have to kind of use your own imagination to see what's going on during this battle. And I kind of like it that way. It's pretty cool. And uh, it opens up with this, I think it's oboe, this very haunting oboe melody. And everything's just really, really silent at this point. The drumming in the background is just really laid back and uh, creates this weird, ominous feel, kind of like the calm before the storm. Then before you know it, Gordon Haskell comes in. And I, I love this part. It's just so ominous and beautiful at the same time and this is a point on the album where his vocals absolutely work he just gives this awesome one minute and 30 second performance where it's just really, everything's just really laid back and ominous and you really don't know what's going on but you know something crazy is brewing under the surface uh then all of a sudden at the 13 i think we're at the 13 minute mark and 30 seconds or something according to my notes here uh, we get this dark Mellotron Doomy riff, the kind of uh, reprising that original oboe riff, and it's really dark, it's really haunting, the drums come in, and it's it's absolutely menacing, so, you know, we just went from sections of absolute beauty, to absolutely menacing, almost heavy metal classical jazz whatever you want to call it it's just the most unique thing ever and then all of a sudden we get this heavy sax groove and the song just switches up to jazz once again with the bow, now, 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 now. and really you get that sax riff kind of just going throughout this entire section of the song really giving it that bedrock that foundation as well as the again the solid drumming by andy mcculloch and the bass playing really holding it down and this is kind of the section here where I think most people criticize it for being like over long it's again this really this jazzy uh instrumental passage that lasts a really long time but it's crazy you got the flutes coming in and the the piano there's some absolutely crazy piano sections going on and it gets some it gets really cacophonous and intense and demonic with the Mellotron the Mellotron here you know 
it, it's amazing how the, how it sounded so beautiful on Bolero, but on this part of the song, it sounds like it's coming from the pits of hell. And I really get into this section. I mean, this part here just really envelops me, and I, I really fucking jam out to this part. So I absolutely love it. Really a big highlight of the song. Probably the most experimental part of the song, but excellent. Then uh, we get a reprise of that original haunting Mellotron slash oboe section that comes in again. And it gets right back into the swing of it. Very nightmarish, very hellish. So if you're not into that kind of thing and you just like the beauty of Prince Rupert Awakens, I could totally see how you wouldn't like this section. Because again, it's just very intense. But, uh, but yeah, it's really dynamic too. It gets into this really quiet, almost like silent jam, moon child section for a minute or so. And then b before breaking into this absolutely crazy freak out free form section there that, uh, you know, if it was long, if, if this part here was expanded to like three, four minutes, then I would criticize it, but it's only like 30 seconds or so. So I could, I could handle it. I could tolerate it, but it's actually pretty good. But now, this, here's where one of the most magical moments of the song come in. The song just winds down. We get this dirgy bass line in the background with Robert Fripp really breaking out of his shell, playing one of his most beautiful and yet haunting guitar solos of all time. This guitar solo here is just, he extends the notes like only Fripp can, creating this mournful lament, really the after perfectly representing the aftermath of this battle. Just one of those incredible moments in prog rock history. It's just so heavy, dirgy. And it just fucking haunts my dreams every time I hear it. It's, it's just one of the big highlights of the song. And that's where the song should have ended. But they throw in this fourth part, Big Top. It's only a minute long or so. And it just reprises kind of like the whole feel of circus with this, I don't know, this uh, circusy, happy kind of vibe to it. It's just kind of unnecessary, in my opinion. But thankfully, it doesn't last very long at all. I really think it should have ended with that haunting guitar solo by Fripp. Because, again, that's probably one of the best moments on the album. But, anyway, you get what you get. But, yeah, overall, such an incredible song. And, you know, for a 23-minute track, for me at least, it goes by really fast. So, I seem to have the opposite opinion of the main criticism that it goes on too long. I think it goes by really fast. It doesn't feel like 23 minutes at all. It feels like maybe, like, 15 at the longest. But, yeah, I absolutely love that song. And it really makes the album worth the price of admission alone. So, I guess that's really all I got to say about Lizard. I mean... It might not appeal to some people, especially if you're not into the whole jazz thing and the, you know, the, the jammy kind of free form sections, but I like those sections, just a really unique album, King Crimson's discography. So really comment down below, let me know what you think about the album. Is it one of your favorites? Do you hate it? Because really it's a very polarizing album and uh, yeah, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks again for watching. Definitely going to be more King Crimson album reviews coming up. Uh, they're one of my all-time favorite bands, so I can't I can't deprive myself of making those. But uh, but we'll see what what comes up next. I don't know what I'm feeling. But anyway, guys, peace out and thank you so much for watching.